All right, time for some revision on um, mutations. Uh, so this is just what we've done in class, uh, just a bit of revision so you can go over it in your own time. So just a little bit of a recap. So we know that mu mutations are basically changes in genetic information. So we can um, sometimes pass them on so they can be inherited or they can occur as a spontaneous mutation. So we'll have a look at uh, the different types of mutations. Um, these are only some of the, the types of mutations. If you go on to study genetics you know, at university level later on, um, you'll learn about many more of the types of mutations that there are, and also these ones in a little bit more detail. So we know that they can also be a good thing. They're not always bad. Okay, because they can um, come about through evolution, so they can be a good thing. Uh, they can be a source of genetic variation, which again could be a good thing. Uh, and it's also the raw material of evolution as well. So if we didn't have those mutations occurring within the cell, we wouldn't have a lot of these um, beneficial evolutionary changes that have occurred over millions of years. They can be detrimental as well uh, because sometimes some of these mutations can lead to diseases um, and, and disorders. Uh, but basically some of the good mutations that to have to do with evolution um, give organisms you know, the ability to adapt to different uh, environmental changes, um, that genetic variation within natural populations. Uh, and when that genetic variation is, is produced, it's done partly by, by mutation as well. Okay, so here's some of the mutations that can have a detrimental effect, um, causing many of those disorders. Uh, and also we look at how variants are produced um, by mutations and how they are inherited. Um, so genetic crosses uh, can be meaningless if all the individual members of a species are identically um, homozygous for the same allele. So it's important we look at that. The example I've got there, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail later, uh, is an example of a suppressor gene uh, mechanism for a nonsense uh, mutation. Uh, and you can just have a look at this top sort of bit here. That's a normal protein coding gene. So you can have a look at those base pairs that are there. So this is your DNA template strand across here. We've had a mutation that's occurred, okay, from the 5N to the 3N. A mutated gene has occurred on this section of the 5 end of the DNA strand. So this A has occurred in that, or well, that's that mutation basically, uh, which is not in the normal protein coding gene. So that's happened through there. You can see too that it's come down during that replication stage. Um, you've got a nonsense code on there, so that's actually going to have an incorrect amino acid. And if it is an incorrect amino acid, then we're not going to get, um, you know, DNA replication and everything working as it should. Okay, so I just mentioned this before. So the genetic crosses aren't meaningful if the members of the species are identically homozygous for the same allele. So this particular diagram, we've got a, an example of a base pair substitution uh, where we're looking at, a, it's basically if you look at the names, it explains a lot of these different mutations. So we have a substitution within the base pair and this is a little, a little blurry, this diagram, sorry about that, but you can hopefully see there that we've got one amino acid has, has basically been substituted um, to another amino acid, when it has chemical, uh, sorry, similar chemical properties, um, that mutation is actually a neutral mutation, so it's not going to be detrimental or beneficial at all. So um, they've got the same one, silent mutations, so that's that first diagram here. If we look at silent mutations and having a look at the, the diagram there, uh, if we get that change in the codon, um, that where the same amino acid is specified, then you get, um, it, well, the codon still encodes for lysine, so in this particular example, so that one is okay. Uh, and then the bottom one in the frame shift mutation here, uh, we've got an insertion of a base pair that scrambles the message after glutamine. 
So that's just a couple of examples of substitutions where you've had one amino acid that's been substituted for another. So the main types of mutations, so the main two types, or so all the different mutations that there are out there fit into these two. So you've got your somatic mutations. So these come about in many of the, or, or, or any of the non-sex cells, and they happen during mitosis. Uh, if it happens early on in development, then there could be a very large amount of, of cells that end up containing that mutation. So we look at mutations on a whole, and they usually can occur once every million cell divisions, uh, and many millions of cell divisions need to occur for a somatic mutation to occur. So some of the cancer uh, mutations occur via the somatic mutation. So the mutation is then passed, like I said, during mitosis, so it's passed on to the daughter cells, which leads to populations of genetically identical cells, so like clones, basically. Okay, so they have no obvious effect sometimes on the phenotype of the organism uh, because the function of the mutant cell is replaced by that of a normal cell, um, but uh, sometimes the somatic mutations um, stimulate cell division and it can increase in number and spread. So that can give rise to cells with selective advantage and is the basis for cancer. And we you know, looked a little bit about that last year in year 11 with cancer cells. The next type is the germline mutation. So these occur in the sex cells and they're also known as the inherited type of, of mutations because they can be passed on through generations in the offspring. Uh, through either their somatic cells or through their sex cells, which are also called germline cells. And you can see the picture down the bottom here. So this is the somatic mutations that we just spoke about. Uh, so that's your non-germline tissues, and they're generally not uh, inheritable. And then your germline mutations over here, uh, because they occur in the sex cells, the egg or the sperm, they can be inherited. Uh, and they can um, either be dominant or they can be recessive. So we looked at cystic fibrosis, which is a recessive trait that's, that's passed down and it can actually uh, skip generations, whereas some of the mutations occur are dominant and they occur in every generation. So it just depends on which one that they actually get. So any time you get a mutation that affects a single gene, um, we call it a gene mutation, and those that affect uh, the number or the structure of the chromosomes are called chromosome mutations. So if you were to look at these in you know, a lab uh, and looking at them directly, so observing the chromosome mutations directly, uh, you can look at those with a microscope. And the gene mutations uh, are detected by observing their phenotype effects. However, we now have DNA sequencing, and that allows observation of gene mutations and chromosome mutations, uh, which are distinguished from gene mutations on the basis of the size of the DNA lesions. Okay, let's have a look now at some of the specific ones. So we have our substitutions here. So these are very simple types of mutations, and it's basically an alteration of a single nucleotide within the DNA. And it can happen in two stages. So it can be uh, in transition, where we have a purine or a purine, uh, and it's replaced by a different purine or a pyrimidine, which is replaced by another. Or you can have it in transversion. So in this case, you get a purine is replaced by a pyrimidine or vice versa. And you can see that in the table below. So here's our transition ones here. So you get a straight... Uh, exchange there or ex, uh, straight um, mutation that occurs uh, and or the, the other one down the bottom here and in the transversion one you get an actual change of the makeup of that particular DNA so it's a little bit bit different so with our base substitutions um, yeah, you get those transitions, all the transversions. Uh, usually the transversions are twice the number of possible transitions. 
but the transition type, so these ones here, these ones arise more frequently. So although these end up with twice as many mutations, this one here uh, happens more frequently, so different types of those. Okay, so that's quite a simple one. Then we have our, and there's a base pair substitution uh, diagram down the bottom, which I couldn't fit on the other page, so you can just look at it down, down there uh, and see the substitution that's occurred. So there and there. All right, so with an insertion and a, dele a deletion, sorry, uh, you get either an addition or a removal of one or more nucleotide pairs. Okay, so although the base substitutions we just looked at are the most common type of mutation, uh, when we look at molecular analysis, it actually shows that insertions and deletions are more frequent. So insertions and deletions are within sequences that actually encode for a specific protein can lead to frame shift mutations um, and changes in the reading frame of that gene. When we look at the fr a frame shift mutation, basically, um, down there, it usually happens, or uh, when it does happen, sorry, it alters um, all the amino acids that are encoded by the nucleotides that follow the mutation. So they can have drastic effects on the phenotype. So they don't all lead to frame shift, um, but um, basically insertions and deletions that consist of any multiple of three nucleotides will leave the reading frame intact. But if we have a removal or an addition of one or more amino acids, it can still affect uh, the phenotype. Okay, so we can also look at uh, nucleotide repeats here. And we have a, a gain of function mutation that's been outlined in this diagram below. So with nucleotide uh, repeats, we have mutations where the number of copies of a set of nucleotides increases in number. So that's a nucleotide repeat. So we've got a repetition of the nucleotide, just as the name sets. So an example of uh, a nucleotide re uh, repeat is the fragile X syndrome. So that's the most common hereditary cause of you know, mental um, disability. Um, the disorder happens because in specially treated cells from people with that condition, the tip of each long arm of the X chromosome is attached by only a tiny little thread. Okay, so it's called fragile X because it's quite fragile. So in people with fragile X syndrome, the allele may harbour hundreds or even thousands of copies of this particular mutation. So the nucleotide repeats are found in about 30 human diseases. Uh, so some of those can be um, spinal muscular atrophy. I just mentioned fragile X syndrome. Um, you've got Huntington's disease. So lots of different uh, Jacobson syndrome. So there's quite a few uh, different diseases that we can well, that we know are caused by these nucleotide repeat mutations. And basically, they're caused by or the diseases are caused by the expansion of a set of three nucleotides, which are called uh, trinucleotides. Okay, so the number of the, the nucleotide repeat often happens with, uh, you know, the severity or age of the onset of the disease as you get older, uh, usually, or whenever it onsets or, or progresses, it can become uh, more severe, as with most, most things when you get old. Uh, and the number of copies of repeats um, also corresponds to, you know, the instability of the nucleotide repeats. So when more repeats are present, the probability of expansion to even more repeats increases. Uh, and in the increase, when there are increases in the number of nucleotide repeats, uh, it can produce disease symptoms in different ways. So in lots of those diseases I uh, mentioned before, like Huntington's disease or Fragile X um, syndrome, the nucleotide expands within the coding part of the gene and that produces a toxic protein uh, that has an extra glutamine residue within there. Uh, sometimes though, with the Fragile X, for example, the repeat is outside the coding region of the gene and it affects its expression. Um, and when that happens, for example, with Fragile X, you get additional copies of the nucleotide repeat. 
and that actually causes the DNA to become uh, methylated and when that happens it turns off the transcription of an essential gene. Okay, so evidence that's actually been gathered, um, you know, on these particular types of mutations uh, su suggests that the expansion occurs in the course of DNA replication uh, and it appears to be related to, um, you know, these hairpins that form uh, and other sort of structures within the DNA that form in a single strand of DNA. Uh, and that's where the nucleotide repeats have been found, so on that single strand of DNA. Okay, so missense mutations are the next one that we have a look at. Uh, but we go back to, uh, you know, these fall into the phenotypic effects of the mutations. Uh, so we can distingu distinguish a lot of mutations on the basis of its phenotype uh, compared with the wild type phenotype. So anything that alters the wild type phenotype is a forward mutation. Uh, and a reverse mutation changes a mutant phenotype back to the wild type. Uh, and so what geneticists have actually done within their study of mutations is put these into um, specific areas that look at um, different parts of those phenotypic mutations. So one of those is a missense mutation uh, where we've actually got a base substitution that results in a different amino acid within the protein. Uh, and you can see from this diagram that is here, and you can see where I got that from, by the way, just for uh, copyright laws there, you can see the the site that I got that slide from. Uh, and we've got a frame shift mutation, so you mentioned that before. We've got an insertion uh, mutation in that particular one. And with that missense, you've just got a different amino acid within that protein, so different to what was already there. Uh, and then the nonsense mutations actually change a sense codon. Uh, and what a sense codon is, it, it actually specifies for an amino acids. Um, and it's changed into a nonsense codon. Uh, and what that means is that it terminates translation. I think I've got a picture of that somewhere. Oh, there's one. Yep. So you can see here that with the nonsense mutation, it actually uh, terminates that translation there. And when that happens, then that particular, um, you know, gene becomes non-functional. So that, or that protein becomes non-functional because it's too short. So in a normal one, you can see that the amino acid sequence continues along there, uh, but when we get to the nonsense mutation at the bottom, it has this stop codon um, that occurs, which will then uh, stop the translation from occurring and becoming non-functional. Okay, so that uh, can cause a few different things as well. Uh, so we've got a silent mutation there. I've got this picture out of my textbook that I used from my study uh, and in this instance we've got a change in a codon um, that actually specifies, I think I've written a codon to, to a codon that specifies the same amino acid. Okay, so it says alters the DNA sequence but it doesn't change the amino acid uh, sequence of the protein. So not all silent mutations are truly silent. Some do have phenotypic effects. Um, so sometimes you've got you know, the phenotypic effects are when tRNAs uh, are used for different, you know, codons. For example, um, the rate of protein synthesis can also influ influence the phenotype um, by affecting the amount of protein present in the cell and sometimes with the folding of the protein. And as we know, uh, you know, these structure of the proteins are very, very important in DNA replication. Uh, sometimes silent mutations can alter sequences uh, that affect the splicing and sometimes they influence the folding of the mRNA uh, and that affects its stability. So if it's unstable, it's not going to go you know, properly. Uh, we've got our neutral mutations. This is known as a missense mutation. So it alters um, amino acid sequences in the protein but it doesn't change its function. Uh, it can actually occur when one amino acid is replaced by another that is chemically similar or when the affected amino acid has little influence on protein function. So these can occur in the genes that encode for haemoglobin, for example, 
so although these uh, mutations do alter the amino acid sequence of the haemoglobin, they don't actually affect its ability to transport oxygen. So you can see that it's, it's not really detrimental or beneficial e either way there. Okay, so almost there. So we've got our loss of function uh, mutations. Uh, we'll look at quickly loss of function and also um, gain of function mutations just to finish off what we looked at. So when we have a loss of function, we have a complete or partial absence uh, of the normal protein function. So the loss of function uh, can occur because the structure of the protein, that the protein, you know, the structure doesn't work properly, in, the protein no longer works properly, uh, or the mutation can occur in, you know, regions that regulate the effects of transcription uh, and translation of that particular protein. So they're frequently recessive, uh, they are individual diploid, um, and they need to be homozygous for a loss of function mutation before we can actually see any effects of the functional protein. Uh, these sorts of mutations that cause cystic fibrosis are loss of function mutations because they produce a non-functional form of the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductase regulator protein, um, which normally regulates the movement of chloride ions in and out of the cell. Uh, then we have our gain of function mutations. So these produce a whole new trait, or it causes a trait to appear in an inappropriate tissue or at an inappropriate time in development. So an example of that could be when a mutation that's in a gene encodes a receptor for growth factor. Um, this might cause the mutated receptor to stimulate growth all the time, even in the absence of the growth factor. So these are usually dominant in their expression. Okay, and they can sometimes be expressed, uh, you know, only under specific, specific, um, you know, situations. Okay, so just uh, hopefully that is just a little bit of a recap uh, of the different types of mutations that we looked at in class. You know, if you're away or you can't remember, you can have a look at that. Okay.